Good morning. Um, now for me, it's great to hear about websites, Facebook, Twitter, etc., because I'm basically involved in none of this, and uh, I, I know I, I'm fascinated by it, and I think these are extraordinary tools, and I highly recommend to everybody to indeed get involved, but myself, I never really have, but then I don't wear a watch, I don't have a cell phone, and I don't drive a car. <coughs> so, <laughs> yet I do travel probably more than most, uh, but uh, without, I, I have a computer, and uh, that's, that's good. Um, we're definitely in a different era. I'm, uh, you know, I realize now I belong to the older generation, of course, um, and there's something nice about that too. Um, and uh, when, when I started uh, Contact Press Images with a group of photographers uh, 40 and some years ago uh, already, um, we never thought we'd last that long. We actually had planned to at least make it for a 10-year period and of, of course, time has gone by, and we've worked very hard, a small group of photographers, very much inspired by the Magnum experience, uh, where photographers uh, are the sole owners of their copyright, where they're working on their own project, and we, as the agency, we made things happen, helped to produce uh, things, uh, get them published, shown, and magazines, newspapers around the world and different, with uh, keeping strong um, editorial control over everything. And, uh, and that's why we've been able to work over the years also with other people who we distribute, such as uh, Sebastian Salgado, who will have a show here soon, uh, Annie Leibovitz, uh, who we've been involved with since uh, 1977, Don McCullin, the great British war photographer, and others. Um, so today, uh, David Burnett, Alan Weininger, Didi Mehta, the photographers I started the agency with, um, uh, confronted to this huge problem of the archives. You know, what and how do we handle the archives, which is the reason why I was so interested in being here. I'm not here as an expert on the subject, uh, it's just that I, like many other people, does everybody hear me? Fine? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure things out, and we are trying to figure things out. Uh, and I thought that I would uh, explain to you a little bit how we go about things by telling you a story. After all, we're storytellers, and I, you know, earlier, um, Penelope very kindly introduced me and said I was had been a student in uh, African uh, languages, which is true. I studied Fulani and Mandingo, and you know Africa is is based on oral traditions, basically on memory and and stories that have been tell, told by the griots and, and 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 individuals to their children to people in the community, etc. And that's, I guess, a little bit the way we operate. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about, uh, which will illustrate the different points uh, I'm going to try and make um, in the next 15 minutes. Um, a story about somebody many of you do know. So usually I don't say the name off the bat, but I will today. Uh, his name is John Morris, John G. Morris. Many of you do know he, who he is. He's a well, legendary, as some people say, uh, picture editor who was, I think, the first director of Magnum uh, uh, Photos and um, had worked with Life magazine and then went on to work with the Washington Post and the New York Times and the National Geographic out of Paris later on. He is today uh, almost 98 years old and very much alive and living in Paris. They could do a Broadway show on him, actually. Um, that would uh, sound pretty good. And um, 
I've known him for many years, and like most people, I knew him as a picture editor, as somebody who you know, was very much involved in photography. And of course, there was a certain kinship, because that's what I do. I've never been a photographer. I've never taken pictures. I don't know how to take pictures, and I have no interest in carrying a camera. But then it's, at least I'm somewhat coherent in the sense that uh, I don't like carrying anything, really. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> but I admire people who do. I really admire people for that. I remember one day in Beijing, I was teaching, doing a lecture in a university, and I was trying to explain to these young Chinese uh, <laughs> photographers or you know, people who were hoping to become photographers how in the old days, which was only about 15, 20 years ago, photographers would operate. You know, they would work in for uh, magazines carrying on one shoulder a camera with black and white film, on the other shoulder one with color film, and they had different lenses, and they had extra cameras in case the other two broke down, and they had different types of film in all their pockets in their, you know, all over the place, and then they had to rewind because it's not digital. You had to rewind, rewind, and then take the thing, put it in, and rewind, and, and then take the picture, and then switch, and turn it around, etc. So I was explaining, I was, I was mimicking, uh, actually, David Burnett, because I've watched them carefully. I watch, I watch photographers work, and, and at once they, and of course, the crowd in front of me was looking, not looking at me, they were photographing me with their, <laughs> with their phones, you know, they're little, bing, 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 taking pictures, they you know, very comfortably seated there, and one of them all of a sudden said, but sir, these were not photographers, they were donkeys. <laughs> and, you now, and that stuck in my mind. It's, it's true, this whole, I mean, the shift has been so tremendous. So what do you do with all these donkeys' work, uh, which is <laughs> my biggest uh, uh, question. And so back to John Mike. So I, I, I do tend to digress. I only have 15 minutes. Uh, I usually need two or three hours to tell the <laughs> truth. But <laughs> I'm a little bit in that Fidel Castro tradition, you know. <laughs> but... Um, John Morris uh, one day called me up, I was in Paris, and said, would you mind having a look at uh, some of the, at, at, at the catalog they're doing of, uh, for, for the auction of the pictures I have because I'm selling all my pictures. Now that's interesting, why would this man sell all the pictures that were given or that he kept sometimes uh, to him by photographer over a 70 year period, or 69 year period at that stage? Um, um, because he needed money. He never thought he would live that old, and his social security wasn't carrying him that far. I mean, he gets like $300 from the New York Times every month uh, or something like this. You can't, you can't live on that. So he first sold all his books, and once that money was spent, which only took about a year, uh, he decided to sell his photographs. And, and, and he did actually very well. A, a gallery in Paris sold the photographs and did a very nice catalog. And he wanted me to have a look at the dummy and just give an opinion as a colleague, picture editor and friend, which I was happy to do. Um, and looking through this uh, dummy that had no credits, no names, no nothing, I recognized, of course, most of the pictures, of many of them, from Cash to to, uh, of course, Robert Kappa, to Katia Bresson, to Salgat, name it. But then there were a few images that intrigued me that of World War II that I had never seen. And so I asked him, whose pictures are these? And very sheepishly, he said, they're mine. But you were never a photographer. He said, no, I never was a photographer, except for four weeks in my life. <laughs> and... I was intrigued. I wanted to see, of course, the other pictures, which he didn't want to show me. He said, I'm a bad photographer. I never did anything good. It's not worth looking at. You're wasting your time, etc." I had endless discussions over a period of several months. I used his 87-year-old girlfriend to convince me, uh, convince him that he had to show them uh, to me because she was smart enough to say, look, Robert's a picture editor too. Let him make the decision. Don't be biased against your own pictures, etc." And that's how I got to see these images. And having looked at them, um, having looked at them, let me do the right thing here if I can. Um, yes. I think 
There we go. So, so he showed me these pictures, and, and, and a year or so later, these pictures became a book. And I'm going to explain how very quickly, because that's what marketing is about. That's what I'm supposed to be speaking about. So I'm taking a very specific example. This book is out in France, has been since April, and is doing incredibly well. Um, but um, John Mars then finally let me look at his contact sheets. So whatever contact sheets there were, because the contact sheets were sometimes complete, sometimes they were cut up, sometimes there were holes in them. Actually, many of the negatives were missing. Uh, he had no idea where they were. He had kept all this stuff in a drawer in his file cabinet for 69 years, um, not thinking much of them. But looking at the contact sheets, I saw, and here are a couple of them, um, and those that are not cut up in little pieces, um, looking through the contact sheets, I discovered interesting images. And I thought, my God, this guy's not a bad photographer, or was not a bad photographer for that short period of time. He was a photographer. I mean, even photographing a butcher, a butcher who looks like Hitler, that's quite, a, <laughs> quite something. Um, and, you know, da daily scenes from France, six weeks after D-Day, um, images that I never saw in, you know, by Kappa or by many of the other, or not many, the few other great um, uh, photographers who come. There were only 16 who were part of the civilians who were part of the pool, and there were military photographers. So very quickly, well, with, uh, having looked at everything, one day I said to John, you know, we have a book. We have an exhibition. And he really thought I was pulling his leg. He started laughing and said, oh, that, don't be ridiculous. Uh, it, no, it's, my pictures are not that good. And uh, I said, well, leave it up to me to decide. And uh, I become your agent. I become your editor. I become your curator. And I make you a star um, as a photographer. <laughs> you will become the oldest emerging photographer in the world. <laughs> Which he actually has become. It, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, so, looked through the pictures and I convinced uh, my friend Jean-Francois Leroy from the Visa pour l'image festival in Perpignan that he should consider doing a show, which he didn't want to do at first because I was that year doing a big Don McCullen retrospective, the biggest show that was ever put together in Perpignan. And he said to me, look, you're getting a little greedy. We've given you the biggest space and the biggest show, and now you want to do a second one. I said, no, I don't want to do a second one, but you must do one and look at the photographs and make a decision, which he did. And immediately, after seeing the pictures, he said, fine, you've got 30 images, a show. And so last year, Don, um, uh, John Weiss was in Perpignan with Don McCullen, side by side. For him, it was something amazing. And, um, and he got so much acclaim that I was immediately able to convince him that we would do a book. He started taking it seriously. And he did. And one day he called me up and said, I've got these letters uh, that I wrote to my wife, nine letters I wrote to my wife during that same period of time. And uh, I think there's some interesting information because we were desperately trying to, we tried to get captions because, you no, know, um, I'll move back to this picture. How do I stop it? I just press on the thing. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Uh, can you stop it for me? on the kiss, just because it's nicer to stop on the kiss. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, because this is an interesting kiss, actually. I mean, everybody knows Eisenstadt's and other people's, but I like this one, uh, this American MP kissing this young French uh, woman in Brittany, and the shadows of John Morris and the other war correspondent who was accompanying him is there. The couple is completely oblivious to their presence. But then if you look very carefully at the hand of the MP, you notice that he's an African-American, which you know, is really interesting in France. This is uh, 
Um, so, so, well, John noticed, you know, he has an eye for things. He thinks he's not a photographer, only a picture editor, but he does see. And uh, um, so, um, these nine letters. Um, so he said, I, 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 I'm going to edit these letters and then give them to you. I said, why are you going to edit the letters? He said, because they're very personal. So I said, well, then you're not going to edit them. <laughs> because the real value, and this is a point I'm trying to make, how important these things become, these letters, the nine letters to his wife. He had kept them. That's amazing. He even kept a telegram that he wrote to his wife in French, which is a beautiful little love telegram that he was never able to send because <laughs> postal services were not working. But he kept the telegram, and he kept everything, and he let it sit in a drawer of a file cabinet. And I'm so grateful that he did. And the, matter, the, the thing is to dig it out, to rediscover it, to discover it, to, and to do something with it if it is meaningful, if you can give meaning to it, because that's what it's about. It's to give meaning to things. And I'm interested in history, very history. And I was immediately drawn to this story because I was born in London during World War II. Um, uh, uh, like Don McCullen likes to say, I was shaped by war, and um, I grew up in London after the war. Uh, it was a pretty miserable place. Moved to Paris, and and actually, as far as I can remember, war has always been part of the the backdrop. You know, the Korean War, then the Indo-Chinese War, then the Vietnam War, then the wars of independence in Algeria and in, in, in all parts of the world, etc. And uh, and I guess that's why I befriended uh, Don McCullen when I finally met him. There's something that uh, is so disturbing about this. And of course, what is happening today is uh, really um, um, more than annoying in that regard. But, and uh, maybe confirms what Don McCullen says, that um, you, know, you don't learn anything about uh, the past, really. But I think you do. And, uh, and, um, and that's why these um, efforts should be pursued and these archives should be looked at very carefully and indeed given meaning to. Um, so I got these nine letters, but also found this amazing dispatch that John Morris uh, wrote for Life magazine that never published it in, um, in, in the summer of 1944. But the original was sitting at uh, the uh, University of Chicago where John had don donated a lot of his um, papers. They didn't want to take his photographs. They had no interest in his photographs. They only took his papers. We dug out the letter and it became part of the book. Um, so we started collecting everything we could, and of course we found this famous picture of uh, uh, John Mo Oops. Uh, jo How do I block this? Say? Yes, that's what I'm doing, but... I oh. Can you do it for me? Uh, not this one, the one before. Okay, this is John Morris. Next to him is a man who's still alive, who is J Ralph Morse, who lives in Florida, and he is 98 years of. He's 98 years old. The, the, um, Ralph Morse. He lives in West Palm Beach or in that neighborhood. I saw him, I interviewed him for the book. I saw him. And up there are. Uh, Tom Landry, George Roger, who would go on to be one of the founders of Magnum. Um, uh, I think this is Sherman, and of course, Father Kappa here, and uh, Shershell. I mean, these, these were the six photographers who were part of the Life magazine um, <laughs> coverage of the Western Front, and John Morris uh, in the middle. The reason why Kappa is wearing civilian uniform and uh, was never under mass head of life is because he was a contract photographer. The others were all sort of staff photographers for life and they had the different status but they worked together. And 
six weeks after D-Day, John Mice uh, was sitting in London where he thought nothing was happening. Nothing was happening. There were V1s and V2s coming down. And they did kill 8,000 people in a short period of time. But it's true that all the action had moved over to France, Normandy, and other places. That's where he wanted to be, to see for himself. Which, you know, he's a, he's a journalist. Uh, he's a picture that is a journalist. He wants to see for himself. So he goes over to France, manages to convince the magazine to let him go as the coordinator of the Western, uh, coordinator of photography on the Western Front, um, the pool of photographers. They let him go because they didn't know better. We're not in the age of the internet. There's no text messaging. It, it takes a long time for things to know. And people in New York had no bloody idea what was going on in, uh, no Instagram to show what was going on. No. So he was able to get, get on a boat, get on a train, London to Portsmouth, Portsmouth to, to Cherbourg, or Cherbourg. No, no, he landed on Utah Beach. He landed on Utah Beach on the 20th or 21st of um, July 1944 and spent almost a month there until August 14th. For some reason, he took a camera with him, a Wallyflex. And for some reason, he took pictures along the way, particularly when there were no other photographers around, and he thought he would make some notes that could be useful, but they ended up not being useful because there was Kappa, Ralph Moss, and all the other guys who did a great job. So he just sat on the stuff. Only one or two of his pictures ever got published after that. Um, so here is in Cherbourg, um, he takes all his friends' war correspondents take pictures of him in a foxhole uh, because there's some. There's a lot of heavy fighting going along uh, at that time. It's uh, people think it was D-Day and everything was over. No, it took months before um, the, before Paris was liberated on August uh, 25th. This is a picture of by Kappa of John Moyes at Mont Saint Michel. Um, they switched. Um, cameras, but I started collecting everything I could find, including this press card um, that, uh, oh, can I stay on this? Uh, how do Why does it not stay? Now it does, because there's a magician over there. Um, no, and you know, these little things become so important. Um, in his book, Get the Picture, John Myers wrote his biography, Get the Picture, um, he indicates that he landed in Normandy on the 16th of July, 1944. And I confronted him with this and told him that was not exact, that he could not only have landed on the 20th or 21st. And he said, well, I should know better than you do because I was there. After all, you know, he was looking at me, I'm a kid, I'm 72 years old, he's 97, 25 years, you know, it's, uh, uh, the age of, uh, the, well, so I said, no, 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 I, I, I tell you why, because if I look carefully at the date here, I do see 15th of July. So technically, yes, this press card established by the French three forces under de Gaulle um, would have allowed him to get on the train to Portsmouth and on a night boat and land on the 16th on, on the beaches of Normandy. Technically, it seemed plausible, but there's a problem because if you look up there, I see a handwritten date that says 18th of July, 1944. Um, but that's high tech. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then we can hear you on the mic. Oh, yes. Yay, look at that. That's cool. <laughs> Sorry? Then you can go to the mic. You have the microphone. Oh, you couldn't hear me? I was trying to... Oh. oh, no, so let me repeat. So 15th of July, so he could have been on the 16th in France, but there's an 18th of July handwritten uh, date here and a signature, and that's when the visa was given him by the Supreme uh, Headquarters, uh, the, the, the Allied Forces. Uh, uh, thing. So that's when he got his card and his visa. He could not have been in Normandy on the 16th. Furthermore, one of the letters to his wife is written, uh, was written on, uh, by him uh, as uh, written on the 18th in the evening. So the earliest he could have left was the 19th. And 
uh, then he said he arrived at low tide uh, very early in the morning. So we checked out when low tide was on that date. It took us quite a while, but we, we did it. You know, we did it. So if you are into doing something with an archive, you have to become a historian, you have to become an investigator. You've got to become a little bit Colombo. Mm. Oh, one more question. Um, I forgot the note. And this is what I did all the time with John Morris, who has an extraordinary memory, except for these things. He never had a caption on any of those photographs. Some of them he vaguely remembered, and it seemed fairly obvious, and we were able to identify them. But then what we ended up doing was calling the city halls of the mayors of all the small towns and asking them when they had been liberated, because we knew he could not have been there before. So once we got this information, we started putting the puzzle together without a computer, just using our no, common sense and brain and figuring out. And I think we've reconstructed almost perfectly his four weeks in Normandy to his greatest uh, amazement. Um, and uh, and I'd show you a couple of examples of interesting things. Um, this is the back of the card. He looked young. He never signed his card, uh, which is interesting. Um, all the images, all the text, everything had to go through censorship. Um, this is the back of a photograph or contact sheet. Uh, you know, 7B, JM, JM, John Morris, uh, that was his code. Uh, these are the dates. No uh, laptops in those days. Uh, <laughs> Hermit, this is a British war correspondent. Uh, um, and, and, can we stop this image? Yes, oops. Uh, well, we could stay here. This is his most famous image, the only one that got, pub got published because seven years after World War II, he published uh, an article in P Pageant Magazine, The Face of My Enemy, where he speaks about this 16-year-old kid who was taken prisoner. See, the, uh, Thursday night, July 18th, I don't know if you saw that. No, I'm trying to make my point here. Okay, so these are the letters. I'm going to go through very quickly. He wrote on any kind of paper he could find. He hand wrote these letters. He used different typewriters, whatever he could borrow from other correspondents. He never took, and this is the, uh, and this, these are different letters, uh, notes he sent out to the uh, office in New York or in London, the telegram, his love telegram, as I call it. All these handwritten um, the dispatch from uh, uh, Brittany, Rennes, on August 4th, 1944, there was no correspondent, there were photographers, no correspondent, so he wrote the dispatch himself, sent it, they never published. And this is something I would like to show you. A group of pictures, he thought this was in Rennes, and he told me it's in Rennes, I'm pretty sure it's in Rennes, uh, in Brittany. It turns out, can we stop this picture here? No, nope. can we go back? Can we go back and block? Thank you. Um, it turns out that this is actually in Normandy. And uh, a local historian sent us uh, the information. We had sent images out to everybody to try and collect information. And one looks, oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, that, oh my God! I've I've never I've never carried so much hardware in my life. Uh, uh, so look at this carefully, and this doorway, and look at this image. Oh no, not that one. The one before, I guess. Yes, and you see here, etc. So we were able to identify the location, as in this case. We had no idea, John had no idea where this destroyed town was. He didn't speak the language, he didn't take captions, he didn't take his photography seriously. So we had to do it 70 years later for him. And somebody sent us this postcard, and if you look at these five buildings, one, two, three, four, five, etc., and you look at this and you Aww. look at these, that is amazing. <laughs> that was incredible. And, 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 and,
you understand? Now, this is also, block this image, block this image, please. Um, these are the letters that had to go through censorship, right? And you can see it's stamped here, it had to be signed. No, no, no. Uh, you had to be, no, um, it went through censorship. But look at the date here. Isn't that amazing? And he kept the image, and that's him today, by, photographed by his girlfriend. 97 now, here 97, still young. Um, and this is him 70 years ago, a selfie. <laughs> A selfie with his own Wallyflex. <laughs> Nothing was invented recently. So these, these are the images, uh, etc. Do I have a few more minutes or am I, no, um, couple? Okay, I'd go quickly. This is the book that came out in France. Uh, that's, and this is the book that should come out in English that still hasn't. We haven't found a publisher. Now, I need to... Oh, sorry? You want to see this picture? No. Come on. Yeah. Oh. Go back to the two images of the books. I don't know if you can see this one. Do what? The two book covers. I may be able to see So that was taken in New York uh, six months ago. Uh, when he came over, I got him because marketing. We've made 11 set of 20 prints, uh, 20 by 20 phenomenal, uh, beautiful, incredible prints that I got him to sign with the idea that we would place this limited edition in various museums around the world, like the, the Museum of Fine Art in Houston that is developing a big collection of war photography, the Memorial de Caen in France that is dedicated to World War II, the Imperial War Museum in England, and other places of this kind. Sorry? No, it's called the um, Memorial, uh, Memorial de Caen. Memorial, it's, it's devoted to um, World War II, basically, and other places like this. So, and we had sold two, two, um, two of the uh, um, sets already. Uh, we haven't even marketed, but one British collector acquired it immediately, and another, an American, they remain anonymous, of course, but we hope there are not too many individuals that buy it because we want to get it into museums. So, is this the second thing? I want to just show you, maybe we'll skip this, because that's the book. The book, actually what I can do, I could leave this book here, it exists, it's real. Um, so if any of you want to look at it, but I would like to show you briefly um, one, la well, okay, okay, see, the book is everything. The letters, all the quotes are words by John. We filmed and taped him abundantly on four different occasions. Uh, we can put the documentary together. Um, these are the pictures. His pictures are always on the right-hand side with captions. Um, on the left-hand side are smaller pictures that are the personal pictures. I had a lot of fun working with the designer working on this, and, and the text is translated into French. But at the end of the book, if I go very quickly, I'd show you like this. He shot 14 walls of film in total. That's probably the smallest archive I will ever have to deal with. <laughs> now. All the English texts are at the end of the book in a facsimile uh, form so that anybody who doesn't read French can read the book. And uh, uh, with Talex's, uh, he sent, uh, with Robert Kappa's captions, he sent to Life magazine, his letters, his dispatch, and so on and so forth. His article I found, I bought on eBay the, uh, the copy of Pageant magazine, so I've got the, an original. Um, um, all this, uh, and that's the book, but I want to show you the last uh, uh, thing, which is only three slides, which is really interesting. Making sets of, um, of, of, of course, of uh, prints, but also we've had phenomenal coverage in, uh, in, in, um, in Europe. 
at the time of D-Day. And that was why I was so anxious to get the book out, speaking of marketing, planning, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and in Rennes, next week, John and I will be there for the opening of this amazing exhibition on the main square of Rennes, where he took so many of his pictures. And uh, this is a three-dimensional mock-up of uh, what it will look like, but with the real pictures in, put in there. And that's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, this is quite extraordinary. This exhibition in different forms is presently in two other places in Brittany, and next year it will open in Bayeux in Normandy. Bayeux was one of the most important towns during the Battle of Normandy. Um, um, the show will open in May and will be there for four and a half months at the Museum of the Battle of Normandy um, until the gathering of the annual gathering of the War Correspondents Jury for the War Correspondents Award. So the, the, the play it has been receiving is tremendous. Um, this show will actually open in China in November. Um, it's been easy to get it. Uh, John next week is before, next week will be going to Luxembourg to give a talk about this. He's invited almost every day, certainly every week, to go and lecture about his book, etc. The only place where we have not been successful at all is in the United States of America. And that is so puzzling. We've approached so many publishers who didn't want to touch the book. Um, the ICP is the only place that is presenting some of John's work across the street until September tomorrow. I think. There are 10 of John's images that are on the walls. I'm very grateful to Mark LeBell to have, in the last minute, uh, a few months ago when I approached him, agreed to put on display his images. And actually, John Morris, a few months ago, was here with me in a conversation, and we were showing some of the same images. So I don't say this is a template at all for what you can do in terms of marketing an archive or body of work by a photographer. But I think it's a good example and hopefully a very inspiring um, uh, one where you can see that old images that even the, the photographer himself uh, never took too seriously can be revived if you can give meaning to it, if you can give a shape to it. And you, know, you have to develop into to something. This is probably the easiest one I ever did. Uh, uh, of that kind. When I worked on Li Zhen Chen's, uh, uh, the Chinese photographer of the Cultural Revolution, it took me three and a half years to do the book because he didn't speak English and I didn't speak much Chinese, I must admit. So we had to do everything through translators and it took an awful lot of time. With David Burnett and Iran, the 44 days um, that we shaped the world, that was in Elysia because in all cases here, these are photographs who are alive and one should take advantage of the fact that we're still alive to take care of the archives. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have to make a personal note. Um, I'm sorry for the delay. No, no. Um, well, let me. Next time we're going to schedule two or three hours for, for yes. Robert. Yes. I think it's <laughs> worth it. I'm sorry. I think we uh, all would enjoy I'd like to hear him even more, and I think, uh, but we do have a schedule. We have other speakers here. Um, on a personal note, John Morris brought my parents to City Hall to have them get married, so he's very important in my life. I get emails from him all the time, and he's gone to five countries in two, like three days, and I'm like, wow, um, it's fascinating. I love reading his little things, and in terms of D-Day, just my father would have loved having you know that he landed on D-Day um, and was in Steichen's unit, in Combat Photo Unit 8, just for a piece of information. We're going to take maybe two quick questions, if anybody has something. I, uh, Robert, you're coming back. You'll be here this afternoon. And Julie will be. I think Stuart is not able to. So if there are two quick questions, otherwise we're going to take a quick coffee break. And then again, as everybody who's been here know. Yeah. And Michael, is there something? So for Stuart, maybe, if there's anything, is, or what, go ahead. Yeah, we have to mic everything, just to remind you if we're taping everything. First of all, that was an incredible uh, presentation, but unfortunately my question isn't.
to that. Uh, Instagram, what are the pluses and minuses vis-a-vis -vis ownership and retention of an image that if an archive starts, let's say, an Instagram series or account? Uh, because it's, Instagram strikes me as a very interesting medium, of course, for a photography archive that you can, you can visually tweet, if you will. But what about, um, does that mean that image now goes out to the world and everybody can use it? Or is there a way that an Instagram image can be owned? Well, I mean, it, it is owned. I mean, that, that's not the question. I guess the question is, if we, will people steal it? But, yeah, yes. Um, Better. You're yeah. giving Instagram unlimited perpetual worldwide rights to any image you upload to Instagram. So if you're uploading to Instagram, you need to just let it go. Same as Facebook, Same as Facebook, I same company. It, 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 let, you'll be letting Copyright it go to, to Instagram. They can, on the Instagram website. But I, that's a different from everyone seeing it, putting it on there. They, they claim a right. They can do whatever they want with any image you upload to Instagram. Let's just be clear they could, about that. They could, but someone, yes. some third party can't take it and put it on there. Their they their can website. and they will. But not legally. And you've got to find them, but not legally, yeah, no. Sure. But I think it's a really important point that everybody understands. You upload an image to Facebook or Instagram, you are giving them a worldwide right to use the image for whatever they want, forever. Whether they will or not remains to be seen, but it's a fact. And I think it's really important to reiterate. People do not realize. I, 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 do, I do think that that is scary sounding, but, uh, I, and I agree, I agree, but I, I think that the, uh, I mean, that, that it's the same with music people, or there's a balance with, you know, giving what you're putting out there to stream, what you're giving away versus what you want to sell, what you want to not have stolen, um, and there's a balance you have to find. At some point, there's a comfort zone between marketing yourself and feeling like you're being, uh, you're giving everything away, so you have to find that, that happy place, but... I do. I think that sentence, what you said, sounds scarier than it might be. In my opinion, I think Instagram is 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 giving themselves the right to to put your image on Instagram, which is what you're doing by putting it on Instagram. I, I think that that is uh, so. That is what it is. I mean, anyone can go and find that image. It's on Instagram, and anyone in the world can look at it and share it. Um, but it will. All, they'll share it. Uh, back to the root source, which is on Instagram. So uh, you're not giving people the right to, to, your, to ownership, but you are, it will be out there. And it will be, but it is in a low, you know, it is a, in a lower resolution. It's not really useful for, for uh, you know, a, yeah, yeah, a, a commercial use or a newspaper's not gonna, not gonna steal something like that. And it, or they shouldn't, or they will get in. But you know, very the, different giving it to Instagram or Facebook as opposed to having it on the web on your own website, right? And the lawyers reinforced about Facebook having possibly the ownership, but they're not, they're not going to implement it. They're not implementing it yet, but they could. I don't know so, what they would do with I don't know what that, that well, would, would do with that, though. No, but I don't think that's a reason to, to right. suspect that they won't do anything. Because right, from our corporation. Yeah. And yeah. if they can find a way to make money from the images that you're uploading, willy-nilly, right. they will. Right. Yeah, I mean that. So, it's, uh, in, but, but you what can you pull say it down. is what you, you say is down. correct. Yeah. You know, the the you have to find that balance between right. marketing your work and protecting your work. Right, and, and it's it, tricky. I mean, it, usually, I feel like I'm I'm usually on the side of I'm, I'm, I talk with a lot of record labels about this, and there are some record labels that are open to putting the whole record streamable immediately, um, and some record labels that will only do a t 10 second excerpt on you know the Amazon preview and never not anywhere else but I, I I side on the I usually side with the more you can you can have out there the better um, uh, I, I think that there's a there's a sort of they're going it's going to get out there anyway you want to have it under your control you want to have people coming back to you you want to provide buy link you want to make it easy for people to buy what you're selling but you want to also make sure that they know what it is and can can, can share it with somebody that might like it um, so there's definitely something you have to come up with that's what you're comfortable with. Well, this is a big I topic. Just, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I have it. Let's talk about I, we I, can go in. I yeah. have just one quick point sure, to that, Arthur. and I think it was glossed yesterday during the, the thing about copyright and social media, is that if you host an image on your own blog or your website, 
and then you post that link to Facebook and you're not uploading the image to Facebook, that's one way to, to get around that. It's just sort of like, you know, you can post personally, like, this is my blog, I've just uploaded 30 great images today, you know, from my portfolio or from my archive, you know, click through and have a, have a peek. Right. Then you're yeah. not giving anybody else the rights. You're maintaining it. You're, it's just when you, when you post an image onto the server that's hosted by your Facebook or your social media account, that's when it starts following, falling under the licensing agreements in the end user, you know, licensing agreement that's 40 pages long that great. No, that's you know, a great gives, them, gives them your children. Very clear. To, I, actually, Robert's presentation really made me think about uh, all the photos that you're not actively showing people that are, that are there in the archive that might be really cool to a lot of people, especially, especially in this context of, of today where formal photos are, are far less prevalent. Most photo people, there's a, the context is more casual, more snapshot, more sort of in the moment um, photography. So I think there's a, an audience for these photos that you're not using. And Instagram or, or online might be a great place to sort of use those to sell the other ones, to sort of, to sort of you know, market the, the... Within reason. Yeah, within reason, <laughs> sure, yeah. So I, I think we're going to take a quick break because um, they, as like Julie and Robert will be here later, this is a topic we talk all about in the meetings, what you put up, what you don't put up. Um, Julie gave a great example with the Mandela, as long as you control it. Anyway, let's take a quick break and we'll reconvene for our next panel. Thank you all very much. Good job, Ed.